This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. More later in the video. Have you ever tried to use your smartphone camera or a standard compact camera or mirrorless camera to take pictures of stars? And have you noticed that the camera or smartphone typically had a lot of trouble focusing on the stars. It would have stars as big disks, and then it would kind of like try to search. At one point, the stars might be pinpoint perfectly in focus effectively, but by the end, the algorithm might get confused and uh, the stars are end up as big blobs completely out of focus. So why is that? And what are the techniques that are used in astrophotography to avoid that? With those techniques recently having been added to smartphones by smartphone makers who have been advertising astrophotography modes. Let's look into all of that. And by the way, even if you're an advanced astrophotographer, I promise there's tons of nice nuggets of knowledge about star focus and star autofocus for the hobby, so stay tuned. Okay, first, let's consider how do mirrorless cameras or smartphone cameras typically or even compact cameras typically work for autofocus. They often use a method that is called contrast autofocus and it's, and it's very easy to understand. Basically, the camera is searching for the point in its focus range where it has the most contrast and it can use very simple mathematical operations on the images from the camera to determine how much contrast there is. Because contrast, like the, the closer you are to focus, because the further you are to focus the fewer straight lines there are. There are there everything is blurred out, nothing is contrasty. Lines are big blobs. There is nothing really to catch on. Whereas the closer you get to focus, the more lines actually become distinct and become sharp and contrasty. And when they are at perfect focus, we get the most contrast. And overall, it looks a bit like a curve like this, where on the x-axis, you'll have kind of like the focus point in the back end within your camera lens, you have an element that moves and that effectively, effectively changes this distance between your objective and the camera sensor or the smartphone sensor. And so the x-axis is the system moving that lens around to achieve different points of focus. And the y-axis would be the contrast that has been measured in the image. And obviously the curve goes up and at the top here, at the point of best contrast is what, where we have the best focus. Very simple. Obviously, there are limitations. If your subject or your scene has uh, different fields, like you have a far away hill and a close by uh, tree, then the camera, as it goes through its focus range, will find like one peak of contrast for the hill and the distance, and another peak of contrast for the forest or the tree near you. So you need to help it by telling it where to focus by tapping on the screen, for instance, which we do with our smartphones. And the camera will restrict its contrast detection to a small area around there and do the proper focus based on that. It's all where very well built. But why doesn't this work on stars? So let me show you some pictures of stars in and out of focus on one of my telescopes. That particular telescope is called a Newtonian telescope. It has a primary curved mirror that gathers all of the light and then focuses it on a small secondary mirror that's in front of it. And the secondary mirror will move the light to the camera sensor. Because we have this secondary mirror, we'll have what we call a central obstruction that casts a shadow on the primary mirror, which we'll see on the out of focus images. This is the star that is in focus. The star itself is nice and pinpoint. The spikes that you see coming out of it are called diffraction spikes and they're because of the assembly called a spider, just like basically steel rods that hold that secondary mirror in place, but perfectly fine. Okay, let's go a bit out of focus. Now we see the star is larger and uh, it has like the small secondary shadow. If you're using a camera lens or something called a refracting telescope, you'd see the same thing, except there would be no shadow at the center. Okay, let's keep going out of focus and even more out of focus. So what do you see? Which image has the most contrast? Well, we don't know. Things don't like from a, a pure, just look at the image, do things look blurred out? They don't really look blurred out. We have a very distinct line here at the outside and in this particular system also on the inside. We also even have lines like within that little uh, little disk here. So an algorithm that's searching for more or less contrast will say like, hey, 
there's a lot of contrast in this image. And they'll be like, the algorithm will be, yeah, there's still a lot of contrast here. Even then, the even here, the algorithm will say there's contrast, but the area of contrast, like the parameter, the amount of lines that are in focus, it's actually larger here than it is there. So the focusing mechanism might get all confused and say like, oh yeah, this is the image with the most contrast. And the only reason why it wouldn't choose uh, an image where the star is even more out of focus is that because the more out of focus the star is, the more spread out its brightness becomes. And so the contrast between the background and the star it itself becomes smaller and smaller, this ha despite having a longer line, a longer circumference of contrast. So the contrast detection algorithm is absolutely confused by stars. It doesn't know what to do. So what do we do when we want to take pictures of stars? And this is valid even for things like the Hubble telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope or amateur telescopes or camera lenses or smartphone cameras. What can we do? Well, one thing we can do is if we're doing manual focus, let's say we have access to manual focus controls. For instance, this little lens here, this is a kit lens from Canon, has a little focus ring on the uh, there that I can use to do manual focus. I can then create what we call a batten of mask. You can see it on the image here, it's this black thing here with all of those slits in there at different angles. The design for this mask was actually created a while back by a Russian amateur astrophotographer called Pavel Batinov, and he decided not to patent the design, leaving it available to all of us astrophotographers and amateur astrophotographers. And you can make one for camera lenses. Heck, I think it would even be possible to make one for smartphones if you have like a 3D printer with the correct resolution. It's a super cool tool. How does it work? Well, it works by using those same kind of diffraction spikes that I had on the star image that I showed you earlier, except that the diffraction spikes will look different depending on whether the image, the star is in focus or out of focus. You can see here the center image, we have three spikes crossing the star image and the spike at the center is perfectly equidistant from the other two spikes. Um, so this means that the star here is perfectly in focus. The star on the left, the central spike is slightly towards the right. The star on the right, the center spike is slightly towards the left. So on the edges of this image, the stars are slightly out of focus. So what you can do as an amateur astrophotographer is you can create or buy or 3D print a batten of mask. I'll put links down in the description, by the way, to some pre-made batten of masks if you're interested. And then you can fit it to your camera lens or, your, or whatever you're using and then play with manual focus until you get an image exactly like the one in the center here and you have perfect focus. That's excellent, right? Nothing wrong there. And this will work in many situations, but it will not work throughout the night. If you're taking images of your target throughout the night, which a lot of amateur astrophotographers with their telescopes do, then the telescope's temperature will change throughout the night. Why is that important? It is important because of the way that focus is achieved. If you look at this telescope here, the blue thing here is the camera with the sensor inside. And here is my objective lens. The telescope objective lens is there. The way that I achieve focus is by simply changing the distance between my sensor and the objective lens. We have a focus knob to achieve that. And by turning this focus knob, I can change, I can basically pull in or out a little draw tube here and that will, uh, and the camera is actually attached to the end of the draw tube and that lets me change the sensor distance. Now, perfect focus is easily achievable like that with the batten of mask, but as the temperature changes throughout the night, the telescope cools down, metal will kind of shrink, even glass, even lenses, the glass within lenses will distort a little bit with temperature changes. This can be just microns measured in microns, and yet it has sufficient of an impact to have visible changes of focus on your stars throughout the night. So when I first started astrophotography, I would have perfect stars at the start of the evening, and the star pictures that I was taking in the morning 
would be out of focus and my computer was doing everything automatically because I didn't have a way to basically fix my focus throughout the night, except waking up and manually changing the focus, which is not ideal. I like to sleep. So that won't be an issue for like simple Milky Way photography, as long as you do it uh, within a short time frame, And, or it won't be an issue if you are available next to the camera on the astrophotography setup to refocus from time to time using the Batinoff mask. But we can be lazier than that. We can automate all of that. And if you have a camera with autofocus or an autofocus lens, you have a focus motor within your lens that you can use to automatically go through the focus range, just like with uh, terrestrial photography. If you have a telescope, just like in the picture here, you can fit an electronic focuser or electric focuser to your focus knob. And basically this thing, it just has a stepper motor inside that can rotate. And by rotating, it will uh, move the draw tube to adjust the focus point. And it is controllable via USB with some USB drivers. So we can have software that controls that and tell the tells the telescope like, okay, focus in, focus out, move a little bit. And in between, it can take pictures and analyze the stars in the pictures. Okay, that's great. But we already mentioned that automated autofocusing on stars was difficult, not because we're not able to move the focus around, we can in camera lenses and in cameras, but because contrast detection doesn't work well on stars. Well, we need another indicator. And if I look back at my star and I bring it gradually out of focus, obviously something that changes is the radius or the diameter of the detected star. And I can just say the point of best focus will be when the detected diameter or radius is the smallest. And so that can work really well. Now, it's not as simple as that, because if you're just going to use the diameter, there are very often on optical systems, whether you're using a camera lens or a telescope on the edges of your sensor, if you have a large sensor like an APS-C size sensor or full frame sensors, Typically, the stars will look less good. Look at this image. You can see the stars are weirdly shaped. They're almost like triangular. They have like weird red color on the sides. That's chromatic aberration. They don't look great. Um, and if you're trying to just get the radius of that, like what is the radius? Is the radius like the, the long radius, the short radius? How are we going to compare? Especially if we're thinking about like stars at the center of the field of view that are perfectly round things can get a bit weird, right? And out of focus, things will also be really weird. So we need a robust way of estimating the radius of the star. And a measure that we use is called the half flux radius or half flux diameter. And we're basically looking for a circle such that the amount of star brightness within that circle is equal to, amount, to the amount of star brightness that's outside of that circle. And we call that measurement the half flux radius. Because of that, we're looking at the point where half of the flux is inside the circle and half of the flux is outside of the circle. And it so happens that this is a measure that works really, really well with out of focus stars, in focus stars, misshapen stars, uh, stars with a central uh, s obstruction like the donut. It works in all conditions. It's a great measurement. And I have actually a video on the mathematical way of how you compute that. If you're interested, I'll put the link above also in the description. It's super interesting. Okay, now we have that measurement that we can use to focus on stars and we can move our focus point automatically, whether it's via a camera lens or via a telescope that has been fitted with an electronic focuser. We can take samples throughout the focus range, measure the half flux radius of stars and find, search for the minimum point. This is how it looks like. This is one of those curves. On the x-axis, just like before, we have basically the focus point position. And on the y-axis, we have the half flux radius of the star. And so we're able to see that as I move the focus points, I'm seeing a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller half flux radius, and then it goes high again. This is exactly as expected. This is called a V curve because in theory, if we didn't have any atmosphere, uh, we were in space and everything was perfect, we'd see a perfect V shape a perfect angular V. It's not the case in real life. In real life, this can be uh, approximated by a hyperbola 
or instead of that, you can use trend lines like we have here using linear regression on the points. And we can say the point of best focus is probably around the point where those two trend lines meet. We can do some more complex stuff. Like on this image, I also did a focusing run and you can see the green dotted line here is an, a hyperbola that has been fitted to the points that we obtained during our autofocus run. And this is another example in a different software, different system, where something very similar has been done. It looks a bit like a parabola there. So we can do curve fitting. And thanks to curve fitting, instead of saying like, oh, this point here was the best focus, or that point there was the best focus, we can say like, oh, the bottom of my fitted curve is actually around here. So maybe the best focus point is around there. We can be super precise. So we're using not just the measurement of the radius of the star uh, and across a focus range, we, we're also using mathematics to do regression and find a curve that fits or even tread lines that fit to find the best focus points. Now, if you're not too sure about all of this that I'm talking about, like hyperbola, parabolas, curve fitting, linear regression, that kind of stuff, you can actually catch up on that in a very simple way. And you can also catch up with math or science in general, because really the best way to do that is to use brilliant.org. Brilliant offers uh, tons of bite-sized lessons, including linear regression that I was just talking about. And those lessons, they're interactive and they explain really complex topics in an intuitive and visual manner. It's really much easier to understand than back in class. Uh, and I find it personally that it's a very, very effective way to learn. Plus, they're adding a ton of lessons every month, so I'm never out of lessons to take. Uh, I'm currently actually learning about the rocket equation, <laughs> how to send stuff into space as part of the classical mechanics course. It's really cool. And it's really cool actually for professionals like me because I can use it on a daily basis thanks to the short lessons because I can use those short lessons during my very short gaps of free time like between conference calls. It's really amazing. And so that helps me stay productive it helps me learn new things and it keeps my brain and my analytical skills quite sharp. I really like that. If that sounds something good to you, uh, to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, you can visit brilliant.org slash quivlazygeek or you can click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Okay, so now that you've learned everything about linear regressions and hyperbola and parabola, thanks to Brilliant, we can go back to things. Because even though it looks like we now have a very robust system to achieve autofocus, that system can run into a lot of issues. So I want to go a little bit into those issues just so you, so you can see what we're up against. Some of the issues could be mechanical in nature. And this is with motors and gears, when we reverse directions, there's typically a amount of time where the gear is floating, two gears are no longer in contact with each other. And that little bit of time when the gears are, are floating, not in contact with one another, it's called backlash. And we can see that on this particular curve here, you can see on the right hand side, we start flat. And the reason we're starting flat here is because even though the motor is moving, and so the software thinks that we've been changing the focus point, because of the backlash, the gear was actually floating, not doing anything. And so we get, we can see the focus is exactly the same. Another type of issue that we can run into is if we start with the stars that are too far out of focus. That's, let's imagine this star is now much bigger. We are so far out of focus that the star brightness has been uh, spread out across almost the whole frame here. It's almost indistinguishable from the light pollution background in my image. And so the software doesn't detect the star. It's not able to do autofocus. And it has to kind of like run through and do analysis throughout the focus range until it catches something. That can be a big issue. Of course, we also have the issue of how the temperature changes throughout the night. There's many ways to deal with that. Some autofocusing systems, like the one that I showed earlier, they come with a temperature probe. So it knows when the temperature is changing and it can just rerun autofocus or even automatically adjust the focus points based on the temperature differences that it measures to really accompany the temperature differences 
for your optical system. That's absolutely amazing. Another more pedestrian and brute force way of doing things is saying like, okay, I want to just refocus, you do that focus run automatically every hour, and that should be good enough. Or if we detect that the stars in my images get slowly bigger, then we run autofocus again. Many ways to deal with that, that's awesome. But there's some more issues still. You may remember I talked about the corner stars on my sensor like here, which are misshapen. They're not just misshapen. Because of the way that optics work, optics, they try as much as possible to match the flat sensor of your camera. But by nature, the images that are created by the optics are kind of spherical. And so we have tons of corrective lenses to try to make that spherical shape of the image flat so it can go flat against the camera sensor. But it's not perfect. And because of that, if your stars at the center of your frame are perfectly in focus, typically the stars at the outside of the frame, especially if you'll have a large sensor like a full frame sensor, may be not only misshapen but also slightly out of focus. So depending on which star you choose to do your autofocus on, you might get part of your frame in focus, the rest out of focus, which can be a bit of an issue. In slightly underpowered systems, like the one here, which uses uh, a Raspberry Pi, for instance, uh, it, to save on computing power, it chooses a single star, and it does that focus on a single star. It's the, the star selection is done automatically. And so effectively, you're getting perfect focus for that star. But the further away you go from the star, especially if you're using large sensors like full frame, the more out of focus the, the stars could become. So that's one issue. There are ways to deal with that. The piece of software that I used to uh, do this focus curve here is a free and open source piece of software for astrophotography called Nina. I'll put links in the description. And it uses, by default, all of the stars in your camera frame. It will detect all of the stars, compute the half flux radius, so the size of all of the stars, and take the average star radius, the average star size, in each of those points. So each of the points that you see here, it's not a single star, it's all of the stars that were detected in the frame. So that really helps us get an average point of focus throughout the frame. And you can even go deeper if your main subject is actually towards the center of the frame, it's a galaxy or a star cluster, you can tell the software to just concentrate on the stars within a square like we see here. Or if we want to have like a balanced focus throughout the frame, we can select stars within a donut here and say, okay, we're gonna perform the autofocus based only on those stars. So we have multiple ways to deal with the fact that optics do not generate a perfectly flat image, especially on a large sensor. Uh, those features where you can select which stars or which areas the stars will be selected for autofocus, I actually programmed them and added them to Nina because it's open source. And with that, I hope this gives you a good idea of why cameras cannot focus efficiently on stars, at least with legacy methods. Recent smartphones, they have astrophotography specific focusing mechanisms which are similar to what we have here. And you now know as well how we can focus telescopes on stars using the half flux radius. There are other ways and other indicators to do that. Some are faster than others. There's a lot of complexity, but you can see how flexible things are and how things can go wrong very easily with like mechanical issues, temperature issues, uh, or field flatness issues. Uh, stars in the corners are misshapen because of poor optics or optics that are not sufficient to recover a full frame sensor. Tons of things can go wrong, but how the amateur astrophotography community and the astrophotography community as a whole has come up with solutions. And I personally find that absolutely fascinating. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like this and learn more astrophotography, please let me know down in the comments. While you're on your way, you can click that like button. If you really want to support the channel, you can also join the channel or even better join my Patreon. I'll put links down in the description. Uh, all of my Patreon members, channel members, and all of my viewers and subscribers, each and every one of you, you truly make the channel possible. Thank you so much. With that, again, I hope this was interesting. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and maybe autofocus on them. And I'll see you next time.